and risk management uh, in organizations, in your company, for instance. Um, also, I will remain on a quite high level of abstraction because we just don't have the time to go into the details, but I hope that still there are some new ideas, new thoughts for you in it. Before we start, let me quickly introduce the organization uh, I'm representing today. This is uh, ASITS. Uh, not quite obvious, but as it stands for Secure Information Technology Center Austria. We have been founded in 1999 uh, as a non-profit association and basically we still are. Um, you can see our members here, their, their logos. So you can see we, are, uh, we have a very strong root in the Austrian public sector. Uh, members are the Federal Ministry of Digital and Economic Affairs, the Austrian uh, National Bank, and a few others, including uh, the University of Technology here in Graz. So we have two sites in Vienna and in Graz. In Graz, we are uh, located actually at the Graz University of Technology. Some of our activities uh, because we have this strong focus on the public sector, we are also assuming some roles there. For instance, if you're familiar with the EIDAS regulation of the European Union, uh, we are the confirmation party and the conformity assessment party according to this regulation. But there are several other activities. Uh, we support the Austrian uh, National Bank in the payment systems oversight. Uh, we have also a quite strong research focus by collaborating with Graz University of Technology and uh, especially recently we also started to uh, identify our efforts in, in IT security consulting where we have a focus on both the public and the private sector. Okay, that's just about my background. Now back to the topic of this talk. It's basically about the risks of your organization. Uh, so the content will mainly be, uh, we will have a look or we will discuss why you should at least know your risks, um, how you can, can become aware of your risks, how to find out what are relevant risks for you and your organization. And then finally, what can we do against them? How can you mitigate uh, identified threats? The focus, as I've said before, there will be sort of a more narrow focus. Um, we will focus on, of course, IT security related risks. However, when analyzing risks of your organization, of course, risks go far beyond IT security. And basically, as we remain on a quite high level of abstraction, most of the methods shown in the following are not restricted actually to IT security, but to risks of organizations in general. Okay, so the first question we probably have to answer, and I hope we don't have to answer it uh, because you already have the awareness that IT security is important, but the first question could be, why should I care about IT security and related risks of my organization at all? And indeed, this can be a valid question because there are a lot of challenges with IT security, especially from an organization from a company perspective. Uh, some of them are listed here. Uh, of course, IT security is not for free. You have to invest money to make your organization secure. IT security is actually a complex topic, so you probably have to spend quite a lot of money to achieve a satisfactory level of security. Then IT is nowadays everywhere basically, and so is IT security. So it's not sufficient if you are a large company to focus on one uh, very specific part of your organization. <laughs> basically, when you want to achieve IT security entirely, then you have to look at your organization as a whole. And another thing is, well, IT security usually does not make things easier. Usually, when you make things secure, they become more complicated. In most cases, for the user, for the end user, where usability is decreased. Yeah, and this can cause uh, quite some problems. So, but anyways, you just have to look at the news and you will frequently find these uh, very bad news from companies who obviously have not invested 
enough effort in ID security. And of course, this is not where you as an organization, you as a company want to end up with. And the bad thing that it's not just all about the money anymore. Uh, I'm sure you remember this very famous hack on Ashley Madison, where it then later turned out that some people actually committed suicide because of this hack and because of their data being revealed. Uh, and then we are at a position where it's not just about the money anymore, but where we have much more severe consequences. And at least then uh, it should be clear that IT security is definitely worth to have a more detailed look at. Yeah. So we can summarize IT security just cannot be ignored anymore uh, by any organization, irrespective of its size and domain. Of course, it makes a difference if you're operating a nuclear power plant or a barber shop, then you probably have different requirements. But in general, you should at least have some, some pace uh, level of security and you should be sure that you achieve this pace level of security. So conclusion, uh, ID security should be on the agenda of any organization. So being aware of that, and I hope I, I could convince you, or I even more hope that it was not necessary to convince you. The next question then is how can I actually guarantee ID and data security in my own organization, in my company? Um, and there is quite a simple approach. Uh, you could say, well, now I know how important ID security is. Just make everything as secure as possible. Only use highly secure passwords, only use multi-factor authentication, encrypt all data that is there, uh, prohibit all employees the use of smartphones, uh, prevent the use of email because this isn't uh, secure either. You somehow then end up with, with uh, this situation and that's nothing that really works out in practice, right? Um, what you see if you really make everything as secure as possible is that the efficiency of your business processes decreases, um, which is maybe not so important for you as an IT or the person that is responsible for IT security. Yeah, but your CEO probably has a problem with that. Uh, and even more important, uh, the frustration level of your employees increases significantly. And this is never a good thing to happen because uh, when people get frustrated about your security measures you have introduced, they just spend all the time finding out how to circumvent these security measures. And in the end, you usually end up in a situation that is even worth, uh, worse than before. So there is another approach you can follow. There is this concept of an information security management system, ISMS, uh, which uh, is basically defined by ISO uh, uh, 27000 standards family. And uh, an ISMS basically, let's read that, defines, controls and monitors by means of policies and processes the responsible handling of a security within an organization. That sounds great. Uh, Unfortunately, establishing such a uh, system is quite complex. The good thing on the other hand is you can get a certificate which you can show your customers and the certificate then says you are caring about IT security. It doesn't say that you're entirely secure, but at least it says that uh, you are aware that uh, you need to care about IT security and that you have processes established, policies defined uh, and so on. Um, such a certificate does not say that, that nothing bad can happen anymore. Still, you might have vulnerabilities, you might be prone to certain attacks, but at least then you should have some sort of, of procedure established, some, some yeah, process established, incident management that defines what steps have to be taken after such a severe problem. So overall, ISMS is quite a nice idea, but uh, quite complex as well. So what we see in practice is that it actually can be an overkill, especially for smaller companies who are not willing to invest that much effort in uh, creating that huge amount of documents of policy establishing processes. However, I think that um, this standards family contains some very useful concepts, 
concepts that are worth to be applied and to have a more detailed look on uh, for any organization. And one of these aspects is basically threat modeling. The idea to have a systematic look on your organization to find out in a systematic way what are my assets, what do I need to protect, what are my risks and how do I mitigate them. These are basically the three relevant aspects. I want to go into more detail uh, now. So we will, in the remainder of this talk, uh, talk about risk strategy. How much risk, risk am I willing to accept, actually? Uh, risk analysis. Um, what are the current problems of my organization? And then risk management. How can I get rid of these problems in the best case? So we have these three cornerstones we will now uh, go through in a bit more detail. First one is risk strategy. What is my risk strategy? Uh, actually, having an idea, a clear idea on your own risk st strategy should be the first step you take when you decide to invest efforts into IT security. And the basic question is how much risk am I willing to accept? There is a trade-off, of course. Um, if you have a high risk acceptance, then you need to invest less work and costs regarding IT security. But of course, the risk that something happens that you don't want to happen is higher. And the financial damage you may suffer from then. And on the other hand, you can have a very low risk accept uh, acceptance. Then you invest more financial resources upfront, but then the chances that you are not affected by a severe problem uh, are higher. So this is basically a an, an free choice that you as an organization can take. In practice, of course, there are some factors that might influence this free choice, which is the industrial sector your organization belongs to. As said before, if you're a nuclear power plant, you probably can't go for a high risk acceptance because there might be people uh, that don't like it. Um, there might be an overall enterprise philosophy influencing your decision. Uh, there might even be requirements from your customers, for instance, demanding a certification uh, for an ISMS. And also how relevant reputation is for you might influence your a choice on how much risk you are willing to take. Uh, an important thing here is that it is quite okay to accept certain risks and sometimes it's even necessary because it might turn out that 100% um, security isn't even feasible in practice. However, um, in that case it is essential to clarify beforehand uh, who takes the risk and who is then also responsible in case something bad happened. So after there was an incident, it should be clear who is now the responsible person who took this, or who made this decision to accept this risk. Okay, so after this first step, we, we have now an an idea on our own risk acceptance, on our risk strategy. Now comes the, from my perspe perspective, most uh, complex part, this is risk analysis. In risk analysis, we basically, you, you basically get to know your organization. Um, the overall goal of risk analysis is to find out what are relevant risks for my organization and how can they affect my organization? What is their impact actually? And this can of course vary from organization to organization. The challenge we face here, or one of the challenges, is the growing complexity of e IT systems and infrastructures in general. Um, we have an increasingly heterogeneous hardware landscape. We have more and more software running on this <laughs> hardware. We have new deployment scenarios, on-premise cloud, and so on. Regarding mobile devices, we have new issuing models like bring your own device, copy your own, private enabled, and so on. So uh, the situation is getting more and more complex, and it's getting more and more difficult um, 
to become aware of all risks that are relevant to us. Of course, another challenge is that new threats are appearing frequently, so there's no time to rest actually. Um, when we are sure about the consequences of one uh, new vulnerability, next one is already there. Um, and the last point, and this is mainly due to the, the increasing complexity, is that the implications of risks become um, less and less obvious for us. So it's, it's more and more hard to say that if, if this happens, then this has this, this and this implication. This and this business process is, is affected in that and that way. That's more and more difficult to say. The idea of risk analysis now is uh, to ideally reveal a complete list of, list of uh, risks that are relevant for us by following some sort of systematic uh, approach. That means that the basic questions we have to answer, we should answer in risk analysis is what are actually the relevant assets for my organization? What do I need to protect? Um, what are the IT services related to these assets? Um, because the asset is just as secure as is the IT service that is used to process this asset, of course. Um, what are the IT components behind these IT services? Um, and then what are now the actual threats for these components? Um, and how do we currently mitigate these threats? Uh, and what, what we want to achieve from this risk analysis is uh, basically a list of components where we have a problem in our organization currently. Um, the very, very, very general method uh, to be applied here is uh, that we have an organization that has a set of assets. We need to identify these assets. We have threats that threaten the security of these assets. And we have security functions, security controls, uh, security measures that on the one hand mitigate the threats and by doing so on the other hand protect our assets. So this is the very fundamental uh, approach we should follow in risk analysis to, to get a systematic overview of, of our organization. So that's the three steps uh, summarized I've just described. And yeah, these steps basically have to be followed. Uh, when we start with the first step, that's modeling the organization's assets. And this sounds more easy than it actually is. First question is, what are the assets of an organization? Of course, when we talk about IT security, then our primary assets are usually data, source codes, documents, accounting data, whatever might be important and relevant for an organization. Um, as said before, these primary, primary assets depend then on other IT assets like software, hardware, also the building in which the hardware is operated, the security of this building can be relevant. So we have quite complex relations here between different levels of assets. Of course, as said in the very beginning, assets of an organization are not restricted to the IT domain, to the IT world. I hope that every organization also sees its employees as an asset. There can be a carpool, there can be phone calls, notes and whiteboards. So the term asset is, is quite broad. We will uh, mainly focus on, on IT assets in the following, but this is just to show you that, that uh, assets is, is not <coughs> limited to IT. So we have these quite different types of assets. The goals of asset modeling now is that we find out all relevant assets, um, but not only a, let's say, a stupid list of assets, but also the interrelations between the assets, the dependencies between these assets. Um, for instance, if you have uh, the primary asset contracts as shown here, then also your asset uh, file server or, or employee laptop might be uh, of relevance because your contract as data is only as secure as the hardware that processes it or stores it. Uh, what we also need to do is to define the criticality of all the assets we have found. Uh, and here, um, 
we have to take into account these dependencies between different uh, layers of assets. So if I have highly critical data, my, my contract is highly critical, then actually also the laptop that stores this contract is, is highly critical. Uh, and to make it even more complex, we then usually have different security goals. So you might know we have this CIA criteria, confidentiality, integrity, availability, sometimes even more like uh, compliance. And we have to look at all these security goals for each asset individually to really become a, a detailed model of our organization. So achieving such a complete model of our organization is basically what we want to achieve. And to show you just a simple example here, and I hope you, you all can read it, uh, you might have how such a model could look like. You, you might have an organization where you have, let's say, two business processes. In each business process, you have certain activities that are carried out. Um, to carry out these activities, you require some sort of IT services. So for, for writing source code, you need some IDE. For uh, creating your documentation, you need some document processing service. Below that, you have the concrete software used to provide this service, uh, like, uh, yeah, I don't know, uh, Microsoft Word, for instance, or, or you need a file server where you, where you store your documents. Below that, you have then the hardware that also might have an impact like uh, PCs, laptops, server components, and so on. But we are not done yet. We still also have to have a look at the security of the uh, rooms where our hardware is located. And the security of the rooms then also depends on the building where this, this room is located. So this is just a, a very simple uh, example actually, but already shows to some extent the com how complex things uh, can become when we, when we try to, to model our organization. Which brings me to the challenges already. And yeah, there again, it's on, on top of the list, it's complexity. Um, usually organizations have a lot of assets, different assets um, with different levels of criticality. And if we build a model of our organization, we somehow need to reflect these, these different um, levels, these different assets. So the first challenge is then, of course, to, to identify the, the set of assets, but then also the, the relations between them is, is quite important. And what becomes a problem then, especially in large companies, in large organizations, is that you actually will not find any person who can provide you with all the necessary information. You might have persons that have a quite good overview of the entire organization. And on the one hand, you might have persons who have the required and the necessary detailed knowledge on certain parts of your organization. And the challenge in, in creating such a holistic picture of your organization is to somehow bring all these people together and to collect the knowledge and to combine it uh, appropriately. Um, when you build this asset model, the biggest challenge is actually not in uh, collecting all the assets. It's in finding the correct uh, dependencies between the different layers uh, of assets. Uh, that's where most work usually goes into. So, and what we have to find out there is um, which components are actually related. For, to find out that, you need to have a quite um, detailed insight into the organization you are modeling. You somehow have to determine the weight of the relation between different assets. How can we find it out? What, what metric can we actually use there? Um, and then again, actually, this is not uh, one error here, but three errors for the three security goals you want to achieve. Integrity, confidentiality, availability. 
could be that a component is very critical in terms of availability for a certain service or data, but not in terms of integrity. And if you really want to model it on that level of detail, that consumes uh, quite a lot of effort. Yeah, as said before, in large organizations, it's especially difficult to, to get the data collected and combined, actually, and to bring the right people to one table. Um, what we also experienced in, in asset modeling is that, yeah, of course, I would say you need some sort of abstraction in your model. A model is always an abstraction of reality, of course, but finding the right uh, level of abstraction is really crucial here because if you are too much into the details, you are, you are just lost and your, your effort, efforts uh, explode. Um, yeah, but unfortunately, there is no, uh, yeah, there, there is no, not the one valid solution about the correct level of abstraction. It depends on several factors like the size of the organization, the, the available resources that you have, uh, and also what you or, or the organization actually wants to achieve and want to get out as a result and as a finding from this model. If you want to go for a detailed and very realistic model, uh, you should definitely consider the use of a tool. There are many tools there that assist you in uh, modeling your assets, modeling risks. Um, yeah, just uh, uh, check out the, the web view. You can find uh, tons of tools there. And they can be really useful. If, if used correctly, they can be really useful to somehow handle complexity. OK, so in, if everything works out as expected, we end up with an hierarchical model that somehow reflects our organization and which contains all the assets of our organization and all the interdependencies between these assets. The next thing we do then is to find out what are now the actual threats, the risks, uh, for all these assets. The starting point is our model we've just created. The goal now is uh, yeah, to find out all the threads. And again, we put the focus here on, on components of the ID infrastructure. Of course, you can also apply these very general methods in a more general way to, to other parts of the organization as well. Uh, just a few examples, when we talk about threats, what, what do you mean? What do we mean with threats? Um, yeah, of course, unauthorized remote access to internal systems. That is the, the typical use case. You have this, this evil attacker sitting somewhere and aiming to get access to your system. But I also put there some other threats just to make sure that we are not actually limited to this classical attacker scenario. Also, misconfiguration of an IT component by your IT administrator, for instance, can be a threat that has to be considered. Or also, if you want to save too much money and you use outdated hardware, then the outage of such outdated hardware can be a threat that has to be considered in a holistic uh, risk analysis. If we go back to our example and we pick out this component smartphone here, which is used for several use cases and activities, then we could end up with uh, such a list of threats. Yeah, data loss due to theft, uh, compromised data due to theft. We could have malware on the device. Uh, the device could, be, uh, could stop working and we have a malfunction and we lose data, therefore we could have uh, known vulnerabilities in our operating system because we use old devices. So this list is not complete, of course. These are just a few examples. Um, but that's what we actually need to do. We need to find such a list of relevant, um, of relevant threats for all our components, for all our assets. And why this model then is useful is that if we know, for instance, that our smartphone is insecure and cannot be trusted anymore, 
we then can use this model to automatically deduce what are affected assets on other levels uh, of abstraction. And in the end, we even find out which um, business processes might be affected by just one insecure component. Okay, sounds not that complicated. Still, there are challenges um, when finding relevant threats. The biggest challenge is probably completeness. Um, how can we actually be sure that our list that we have found for our asset is complete and that we didn't miss any important threat? And again, there are different basic approaches you can, you can follow here. Again, you can somehow play with the level of abstraction. If you define threats on a more abstract level, you probably cover more threats, but then of course you lose uh, some details, and some sort of, of detailed information regarding the threats. Um, what is used when you make use of such tools I've mentioned before is that you rely on some sort of catalogs. Um, some of the tools uh, come with such catalogs integrated, so there you might have a smartphone object and the tool already provides you with an uh, updated list of um, threads that are relevant for smartphones for this specific smartphone. So this can help you to achieve completeness, uh, but still this is not an easy task. And actually you can never really be sure that you have not forgotten something. Okay, but in the ideal world we uh, have all our assets and we now also have the related threats to these assets. Which brings us to the third step we need to carry out and this is the evaluation of current security functions. So finding out how well are we protected currently against these threats. Security functions, security control, security measure, there are different terms we can use here. Basically protect against one or more threats. Simple example, if you have redundant data storage, then you should be protected against data loss due to a, a malfunctioning hardware. Um, usually one threat can also be mitigated by different security functions, which again makes things a bit more complex. Uh, but basically we can say that there is nearly for each threat, there is a security function that can mitigate the threat. Uh, the security function can be a technical security function, technical measure, or also an organizational measure. Uh, and of course, someone, some measures are cheaper and others are very expensive and, and cause a lot of effort to be implemented. What we then need to do is to uh, map identified threats um, to this security function. Um, yeah, and then we find out if our organization actually implements the security function. And ideally, each threat we have identified before, identified to be relevant for our assets, uh, should in the end also be mitigated by at least one security function. Um, also here challenge is sort of completeness, but not as bad as when identifying threats. Just going back to the example to, to show you a con concrete example, we had this list of threats for our uh, asset smartphone here. And then we hopefully found for each threat one or more security measures. For instance, we found out that we have uh, backup processes, so even if our smartphone got stolen, uh, data is not lost. It's still compromised in terms of confidentiality probably, but uh, on the availability side we are, we are sort of safe. Okay, so we now went through all the three steps when on a very high level when doing a risk analysis. Uh, and what we should achieve in the end is um, that we have a model that reflects the current state, security state of our organization. 
in an ideal world, this uh, current state is already the state we want to achieve, the targeted state, so where everything is secure. Uh, unfortunately, this isn't usually the case. So in the end, usually you will find some threats, some risks that are not yet mitigated by you and your organization and the implemented security functions. So to sum up risk analysis, we can say that uh, risk analysis basically helps you to understand your current shortcomings and it also shows you how they affect your assets. And uh, the more detailed your asset model is, uh, the more findings uh, you can pull out of this model in terms of what are affected assets and, and how are they affected. The important idea behind all this is this, that you follow a systematic approach uh, to identify assets, to identify threats, to, to evaluate security functions. Uh, as I've said, our systems become more and more complex and only by following a systematic approach we have at least a small chance to, to get out valuable and, and meaningful uh, results of our risk analysis. Okay, so we had an idea about our risk strategy. We carried out risk analysis and now we know where our problems are. And now the third cornerstone, the third major step is now risk management, which has the goal to transform the current state of your organization, which is probably um, not ideal, into a target state, defined target state. Um, where you at least know where your remaining risks are. Um, approach is quite simple, eliminate all the risks step by step, but again more easy said than done. Uh, basically there are different strategies uh, how you can get rid of identified threats and, and um, yeah, weaknesses. I've listed four strategies here. Um, Simplest one is just remove the affected component. If you find out this, uh, yeah, this server is, is insecure because it doesn't receive any patches anymore, just remove it. Uh, sometimes this works because you find out that the server isn't necessary anymore. In most cases, this simple approach, of course, won't work. Um, you can also outsource the affected component if you say, yeah, I could invest a lot of money to make this component more secure or I take this component or this service and uh, pay some other organization to provide me the service, cloud service for instance, then uh, you also can get rid of problems. The most technical approach probably is the third one, just implement further security functions, make your systems more secure. Um, the bad thing here is that you have usually this trade-off between security and usability. So making things more secure in many cases decreases usability on the other hand side, uh, especially for end users. So to cope with this situation, the fourth strategy could be an idea where the idea is to, to somehow split a problematic service. As an example, assume you surprisingly find out that email is not the best idea to exchange confidential data, um, then you could split this service into, let's say again, email and a more secure data exchange uh, service. So you still then can uh, use email for your daily business for exchanging unproblematic data, but you also have this more secure service then. Of course this introduces additional effort, you need this new service, you need a policy that defines for your users, for your employees, which data can go over which communication channel, you need processes that enforce this policy and so on. So this doesn't make uh, things easier but uh, yeah, that's what you have to cope with when making things secure. The ideal strategy is uh, can't be said. Uh, it's important to have these different strategies as they provide the, the opportunity to flexibly react on the current situation. 
but it depends very much on the current situation, on the service, on the threats, uh, which of these strategies or even a fifth or, or other strategy might be the best one. The final result of risk management uh, is then that you ideally have transformed your organization from a less secure state into a secure target state. So to sum up, risk management um, supports the elimination of shortcomings that we have identified in risk analysis uh, and by that increases the overall level of security of your organization. So we went through these three major steps, risk strategy, risk analysis and risk uh, management. And this was quite theoretic now, right? So the question is, how does this all work in practice? Um, and the bad news are that our experience shows that in practice, uh, things are usually much more complicated and, and complex, as for instance shown in this very simple example here. Um, in practice, especially when you're dealing with a large organization, you, your model will needs to remain on a certain level of abstractions. Otherwise, there are just too many details you have to cope with and this is just, uh, you just can't handle this anymore. But of course, by going on a higher level of abstraction, you might lose some relevant details. In practice, it is usually the case that also after risk management, there are our remaining risks. So you might find out that it is currently just impossible to find a suitable protection against the risk. Um, as I've said in the very beginning, it's basically okay to have remaining risks. It's already a good thing that you know that there is a risk. Uh, then you are already further than a lot of other organizations who are then very surprised if uh, a risk causes some damage. Uh, if you know that there is a risk, then you can at least prepare for it. Yeah, almost in time. Uh, to sum up, uh, as I said before, this were just 45 minutes to, to handle a very complex topic. Uh, I hope I could give you an idea on on this topic of threat modeling, risk analysis, risk management. Um, I hope that we all agree now that the security is important, but as you're sitting in, an, uh, in this event called Security Week, I assume that you already have the awareness for that. Um, we went through the cornerstones for a profound approach towards ID security in your organization, which is defining your risk strategy. Um, identifying your current problems, finding solutions to these problems, uh, and in the end, probably finding out that you have some remaining risks, but at least being aware of them. Um, the main challenge in practice from our perspective is, as I've said many times already, complexity and completeness. Our world is getting more and more complex, so is the IT world. Um, and it's just hard to handle complexity and to achieve completeness in these very uh, complex systems. Respective tools can help here, um, but one should be aware that uh, each tool also comes with limitations. Uh, each tool implements a certain methodology, method, um, so tools can help, but, but be aware of their limitations. And one last important thing that I think is, is definitely worth uh, mentioning. Um, when you want to do threat modeling in your organization, risk management, risk analysis, this is not a process you do once and then you create a report and then you are done. This has to be a continuous process. Things are changing so quickly um, and yeah, it's, 
simply necessary to always be up to date here and to consider all these new and upcoming uh, vulnerabilities, changes and so on. Okay, that's it from my side. Thanks a lot. If you have any questions, of course, I'm happy to answer them.